Hi, I'm Kevin Lee with the eMarketing Association. I also, many of you know me as the founder of Did It, a digital first agency that originally started in the SEO business and then paid search, but then transformed into more of a full service agency through 11 acquisitions. I also uh, run a nonprofit called Giving Forward, which is a cause marketing based nonprofit. I have the pleasure of uh, chatting with John Durham today. Uh, he runs uh, Catalyst SF, uh, which is a very well-respected agency. So to some extent we, we compete, but we rarely see each other uh, competing. Uh, maybe it's geography, maybe it's areas of focus, but I've always really enjoyed uh, John's perspective on things. Um, so John- Right my, back my at first... you, Kevin, right back <laughs> at you as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and, and I've always really admired your creativity. I, I sort of feel like, you know, I may come to things from a more analytical perspective and you tend to come to things at a more creative perspective, but I think everybody blends everything to some extent. But, you know, I've noticed that in the last few years, uh, it seems like creative has become more important because as media becomes auctioned off, you, you can't afford the media if your creative sucks. So, uh, you know, there's an old adage that you know, when people are sitting around talking about the Super Bowl, they're not talking about being that third spot in the pod, or they're not talking about where you are on a page, they're talking about the power of the creative. And we forget that our business is about two things, media, which you and other people do really well, the medium, it's also about the message. People don't pay, you know, they don't, they don't, they don't give as much attention as they do, because it's, it's, you know, it's very hard to track. It's very emotion. It's very benefit driven. And, you know, for most for majority of people, that makes it not as much fun. Creative directors for the years, Kevin, you and I both know they never took it seriously. And which I just think, what an incredible page you have a place to really be in front of somebody with a palette of information and they blow it. No, oh, I Look, I love, I'm in awe of creative. I, I love looking at great commercials, great placements. But digital doesn't get the attention it should. And because of that, I, I think we, you know, uh, it gets hurt. Now, it's even more important because you have 10 competitors instead of three. How are you differentiating? Because everybody can buy programmatic. Everybody can buy good placement. But you cannot buy the power of a good message. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, to what extent do you think um, brands are under investing in creative? Do you think they should be doubling the, the level that they invest in creative? Do you think that it's just like a 20 or 30 percent under investment? Or you know, if you had to guess based on the, the conversations that you have out there with with prospects and with clients, you know, since creative doesn't get the respect it deserves, how, how far off are they? Well, I think it starts with, you know, you, you mentioned earlier areas of focus. We like being on the front end. What is that point of differentiation? Making sure, like, you know, I know exactly what you, you know, how you started out and how you're different. I can position you very effectively as you do this, this, and well. Once you arrive at that sense of definition and purpose, then, then you just sit down and you're like, okay, how do we deconstruct that? Do we find some unique messages? Do, do we do it with a celebrity? Do we do it with wordplay? Do we do it with colors? Do we do it with music? And you start going at it. If I were to use percentages, I think it's 51% creative, 49% media, because the science of media is pretty good. It's not pretty good, it's damn good. And then we need to get back and we need to give creative a little bit more juice. I don't want it to get too far out there because you still have, still has to be grounded in, in, the, in the, the base of science, but it needs, it needs the attention. But it starts with what is the strategic message and, and mission we want to accomplish and what is our points of differentiation? And once those are added, it's so easy. It is so easy then to find that strap line, that, that 41440. I look at Geico and Progressive. They're both in it. They're both in insurance. One, one gives you 15 minutes and you'll get a better price. You know what? And that works. It's a clean message. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I mean, it, I think one thing uh, those two advertisers in particular have embraced, perhaps not, uh, perhaps Geico started it. I'm not sure who started it. I think Geico probably did. But humor in advertising and creative um, to break yeah, through the clutter. One, I, I think it's 39%. Sorry, where I'm looking at it. The number one emotional benefit in creative is humor, then followed by fear, and then followed by sex. Those are the three key. Those are the three key. Uh, humor is almost forty percent. People love laughing. I mean, you know, I know people who hate. Oh, I hate adver- I mean, I hate advertising. But you get them to start talking about commercials. They can talk. They don't equate the two. Humor, and then fear. And then, and then you know, sexual sense, you know, sensuality, which the British and the French and the Germans, well, not the Germans, the British and the French do really well. Right. I mean, the French use sex to sell everything, and it works. <laughs> and beer companies, I guess. <laughs> and, and it, it at the edge, and that's what people remember. And I think you're finding that the, the CMOs and the teams today and the agencies are now realizing. We've got this incredible screen, you know, digital, all the, the, from our phone to our laptop, everywhere. We have a chance to really engage that customer with some beautiful creative that's memorable. So one one question I've got around creative is uh, often for brands, uh, they've identified uh, several different personas, right? So they don't have one buyer persona, they have several buyer personas. And uh, in digital, at least up until recently, it's now with the disappearance of the, some of the tracking, we may not have quite that level of control, but certainly within digital, we have a little bit more control than perhaps just buying one Super Bowl ad with the same creative that everyone watches. So I guess the question would be, you know, what, what's your, what, are you, what are your thoughts around best practice as to how niche to get with your creative? If you think there are three big personas that are, you know, in your target audience and they they're sort of, they, they're different and they're making their brand choices differently. Does it make sense to try to come up with one unified brand message for all three of them or same brand message but different executions creatively uh, to try to attract those different audiences? Great question. And, you know, I think of Nike, you know, they've used Just Do It for 29 years and, and it's as fresh today as it was when Wyden and Kennedy kicked it out because they do play on what you said, those executions, they know their audience. They know those personas. I'm not a big believer in that one-to-one marketing because also you may find there may not be enough people, but you try to get as close to your customer as possible. And the way to do that is I think you hit the magic number. I think people who try to go in for five or six or seven personas, archetypes, they're on drugs. Three, win, place, and show, make sure those work, you know, really know who your winning audience is. You know, what I call the 40, 30, 30, 40%, you own that win. And then the other two split it. And three personas is enough. And the the second two are really going to be variations of that primary. It allows you to have better control of your message and you can execute against it, depending on which uh, digital platform you go with. And you don't confuse the customer. I mean, you know, Geico, give us 15 minutes and we'll give you a rate price. As much as I hate those commercials and I hate them, when my insurance came up, guess what? Kevin, I went and, okay, I'm going to see if it works. Sure enough, it did. You know, (laughs) I didn't change. But the fact is, you know, it was in the back of my mind. We take our business way too serious. Customers like if they like it, they respond to it. Right. And, that, and that's what I think is important. You can find that right execution if you know your points of differentiation and why you stand out. Another question that sometimes comes up in uh, creative brainstorming meetings is uh, production value, right? So uh, 20 years ago when we were doing advertising, each of us, right, the uh, the the, the, the the budget to produce a TV commercial was had a lot of zeros at the end of it because everyone expected a pretty high level of production value and the 
you know, everyone that was involved in it and you had art buyers and, you know, sometimes you do custom photo shoots and you do custom, custom uh, video shoots and talent had to get paid. And, you know, now I think for, a, it seems like for a lot of brands, their brands allow them, their brand persona allows them to get away with sort of pretty low production value, almost iPhone level production value. You know what, to, mo to most people, that's Spielberg quality, you know, it, it, we, we were very comfortable with Android or iPhone visuals. Uh, I also think it allows for speed to market when you need to make it, sorry about that, when you need to make a change. Um, when you need to make a change, it allows you to do that. It's not that the customer is settled for uh, uh, mediocrity. Production is nowhere near what it is. You don't need to fly to Fiji. You can build a background in five minutes. Do you, do you feel like um, creative directors and, and brands should think of influencers in the same way they thought about celebrities in the past? Or should they think about influencers differently, given that some influencers essentially look a little bit like their own publication or their own broadcasting platform? So they, oh, they don't I, just I, come I, with the I cachet. View, I view the rules as similar. I view that all that is, it's just that it's the new, it's the new word. But no, you still use the same, same rules. You know, uh, there's a little bit more complexity in the compensation, but I still view it as that it's the same kind of treatment. You know, would they use the product? You know, are they are they just taking the money? Do they actually consume it? Does it is it a logical and an emotional fit? Would you know? Would you would you use the product? And I think people see that because they they're looking to yeah. they're looking to those influencers. Great. Uh, are there any um, sort of platforms coming down the pike uh, that you're excited to, you know, to experiment with? Uh, obviously, there's always a shiny object, uh, you know, in the in the areas of digital. Uh, so, is there anything you, you see coming out of any of the platforms where you're sort of excited to get a client to empower you to try it or test it? I think everybody's got, you know, everybody's got some sauces that, that are simmering. Um, I'm relatively neutral on that. I'm just more concerned that the investment on the message, you know, I'm not worried about how technology plays and worry about that because I think everybody's doing a good job. You just find the one you're comfortable with. Still goes back to what you talked about. What is that message? You know, like if you don't get that right, you know, I saw some new executions for Nike I'm used to just do it. And I'm thinking, wow, this is beautiful stuff. And then I just remembered, wow, it almost looked like just do it was be totally being reintroduced. So you can, it's really how you bring it all together. And I think that's the important thing. Do you feel like uh, video has, you know, uh, advantages that can't be overcome with, with sort of more static creative or, or audio? Or do you feel each of them can deliver a lot to an overall creative plan. I think video is just cat's meow. I think that's, I think we live by it. We live by, if you're not building messaging for the phone as the first way, you're not gonna make it. Uh, and I think video allows that. I mean, I've watched people watch full length movies. I watch, you know, they're engaged in that device and you just have that opportunity to do so much sight, sound, and motion, bring it all together right. in an intimate way. Right. You're no longer dealing in that you know, world that you and I know where television is, what, three feet away and this laptop is 12 inches away, but that phone is right in front of you. So video allows you to do it so many good ways. And uh, it's interesting, you know, we, we went through a, a transition from, you know, when, when uh, they named media types based on the time of day, like, you know, drive time or uh, prime time or daytime right and then they you know the soap operas were soap operas because they were sponsored by soap right and uh so back back in those days you know to skip a commercial you have to walk out of the room to go to the bathroom right that now it seems like between ad blockers and and uh and just the ability for people to sort of move to engage with another piece of content with with one click or or via voice in some cases it seems like that's actually really heightened the need for great creative because 
you almost have you know three seconds from when creative starts to roll before the person decides whether they want to leave or not. We've always had that. We've never really had to consciously think about it because, you know, the idea that we pushed it on television, we pushed it out of home. We never really thought what the customer thought. You know, it's really interesting. You, you hit upon something that I find so true. You know, you ask so many people, hey, would you pay for free? Would you pay for Spotify to go away with, with ads? Would you pay for all these things? And more, seven out of 10 people, absolutely not. So it's not that they're turned off by advertising. They're turned off by stupid, irrelevant, dumb advertising. And that's the function of creative. And, and what you just said, I think, is so important. If you, if, you, if you spend time on the message, you engage in, boy, you have to get it right. What is prime time? I mean, prime time for us on the West Coast is 7 a.m. to 11 a.m. to dealing with all you, you New Yorkers. Um, and, you know, what is drive time when people aren't driving? You know, I saw a psychologist study the other day that said the pandemic has added two hours and 20 minutes to everybody's life. Okay. That's 10 extra hours a week. Does it mean we're working harder? Yes. Are we working longer? Yes. So I may see a commercial in the morning, forget about it, see it late in the afternoon. Oh, wow, that really stood out. I don't know what my prime time is anymore. You know, I've discovered an afternoon nap, you know, <laughs> uh, which I think is fascinating. And the creatives who really are looking at how the world and how people are bringing that currency of time in. And they're thinking about what is that, again, that, that POD, that point of differenti differentiation, you can win. You really can win. Yeah. yeah. I mean, you have a great story. You know, your acquisitions, you know, what all you've done is like, I can define you creatively. There's a lot of great execution on that. Well, thank you. Um, well, you know, I look forward to seeing uh, what continues to happen in, in, in the, the world of creative execution. I'm, I'm actually been, been pleasantly surprised at some of the, the spots, uh, including long form spots that I've seen uh, recently. You know, the De Niro Federer thing, I thought was just incredibly funny. Oh, my God. I mean, again, where did it come out of it? You know, it didn't come out of the U.S. You know, we're so damn timid and tepid. And this, I mean, that stuff is beautiful. Stuff that comes out of Australia and Britain and France and Spain and Italy and South Africa. They push those emotions. That Federer is a riot, okay? People are talking about they're sharing ads. Tell me when the hell did you share an ad? And if they're sharing ads in the U.S., it's usually because of some celebrity or influencer. But I mean, that ad, again, had all the elements are right. It had a clear message. It had the right bodies, and it had a little bit of a punch. It, oh wow! You know, it got your attention. Yeah, no, I, the, the, when I see that, it, it really restores my hope in great creative. Yes. Uh, as your, your point is, I think maybe people in the Uni United States have gotten too timid to push the envelope. Like, I'm not sure that they would have written a, a script that had "fuck you" from <laughs> from De Niro in it, right? But the Swiss were like, "Sure, let's do it." You know, so all right, here's a good here's a good one for you. You and I have seen a thousand car commercials. How many times can you go down the hill in San Francisco? How many times can you ride on an open road? Can you tell me one Ford, one GM, one Chrysler spot that stands out? Hell no. You know, the Mercedes, they talk about John Hamm, the voice of John Hamm. Like, who is it? Uh, Samuel Jackson, the you know, god of Visa, you know, because of his voice. Again, that's the power of creative of audio. The Federer is a class, and Roger Federer just stayed Swiss. Very all of a sudden, you're just like, this is great. This got people talking. The brand wins. The brand buzz. Um, and you just wish there would be some ballsy creative directors who say, you know what? But you know, creative directors will say the client has to do that. Clients get nervous. They get nervous. So whose fault is it? Do you think that the creative directors are, have stopped pitching it to the clients? Do you think it's the client saying no, or do you think it's the, the legal team at the client saying no? I think it's a legal team. I think it's a finance team. I think it's a board, you know, as I think brands are afraid to be ballsy. 
it's easy to be in a sea of sameness. Um, or they see Geico and progressive as, oh, those are really dumb. Well, guess what? I'd love to make the kind of money they're making. I'd love to make the kind of impact because they inevitably get talked about. That tourism ad, you know, they, they couldn't buy that level of publicity that they got on top of the one, the spin that they got. Um, you know, that's why I like, you know, coming back earlier, that's why I like three personas. You can actually play with one. Digital allows you to do a little bit more experimentation than buying, quote, primetime television. It allows you to be edgy. I saw, and it's not, we're not talking about this video. I saw some bus bus shelter and uh, out of home ads around San Francisco for a couple of products. Uh, one, Duck, Duck, what's the search engine? Duck, Duck. Uh, duck, Duck, Go. And it was like, wow, that's pretty cool. That got my attention. I stopped. I looked at it like it's the power of those words with that right image. You know, they wanted me to look at it for five seconds, and I did. And, it, you know, I, I remembered, at least I remembered Duck Duck, um, even though I probably still would say I go Google, I might, I Google when I don't. Um, but, yeah, I I just think we're, we're, we're in this country, we're afraid. I, you so know, I, that, that, that makes me think back to Dollar Shave Club and, and the fact that when brands start getting timid, it's an opportunity for an underdog to come in there, amen. be edgy and kick their butts. Challenge your brands who take advantage of, that, of their first, like that, the person who's on top, which usually has a good, clear message. You know, here's a challenger comes in and find that edge. You know, I, as much as I like Nike, I think Adidas every now and then will hit it out of the park because they'll be edgy against just do it, you know. Um, then um, somebody may reel it back in. <laughs> but, I, but I look at all the beverage brands, see a sameness. Car brands, a see a sameness. Um, Matthew McConaughey much as I don't like, I think he does a phenomenal job for the brand because it's got a little bit of an edge. Um, not a lot, but it's got at least a little bit of being out there. Right, right. What's the actor who owns like three or four brands and keeps, keeps has, has now an agency in Atlanta, I think? Oh, uh, Ryan. Oh, here's, and here's an example. You know, he's built a brand himself utilizing advertising to advertise his products, and he does a good job with Mint, uh, Aviation Gin, you know, he's at least propelled these brands, which were not in the top three, to points of consideration. Yeah. Because he's bit, he understands the power of branding, understands the power of, of influence and celebrity, and he's molded them in a way that drives really good messaging. It's not earth shattering, and it's not high production values for sure. Right. Not even close. Yeah. So I think that that underscores the opportunity of, of an underdog brand if they can use a combination of humor, celebrity, and and finding their positioning, they can really shake things up. And then you know you bring that great science of data, the kind of work you do. I mean, you're not just hitting, you're not just putting runs, you know, on the scoreboard. You're hitting grand slams. You're going to win the game. Absolutely. You know, great. Well, I, that's important. <laughs> yep. Yeah, but it was a pleasure. It was a pleasure catching up with you. Um, I'm glad you were able to make the time and uh, find the time to kill kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> I'm so sorry that uh, sort of the alarms went off, but I mean, I'm getting it, it, uh, some some treatments and I get enough juice. This is a mantra for me. So talking with you about this, I think, is important, and I think calling attention to it, you know. Is, is critical because the brands that are going to step out, like a tourism brand, you it, it may have been in your consideration, but at least now now you remembered that's what's important. That's what we got to get out there. I yeah. love great creative. Yeah. Well, when you look at one show, when you look at one shows and Clio's and all that, all you see is great creative. And you're saying, why the hell aren't we getting that in digital? Yeah. Now's the time. I agree, uh, and I hope I hope those examples inspire brands to take more risks because otherwise their lunch is going to get eaten. Yes. So yes, and when I hear the words data-driven creative, 
it should be it should be creative data data outcome you know that to me is like here's a message we're using the information and we're going to have good outcomes so that's cdo reversed right right that's a great point <laughs> great point well john uh i'm sure i'll see you on one of our networking events uh over the next week or two but uh, this is great for, for us to be able to talk one-on-one -on -one. love what you're doing you know thank you my friend yeah. always I, I you you and i enjoy chatting back and forth thanks all right Have thanks john bye -bye. safe travels right bye